Venus is our closest neighbour and the brightest body in the night sky after the moon. It's believed that it formed at the same time as the Earth, condensing from a cloud of gas around 4.5 billion years ago. Both planets are similar in size, mass, density and volume. But there, the similarities end. The very first picture from another planet was from a Russian probe on the surface of Venus and it found this incredibly inhospitable world. It's completely covered in clouds, um, you know, it doesn't have oceans, it has this big thick atmosphere, hot atmosphere. So a really, really different planet to the Earth. It's a bit like being one kilometre down the sea, like a big dense swimming pool that's also as hot as a domestic oven. Spacecraft that have reached the surface of this planet have only survived for a few hours. And observations from orbit are difficult due to dense clouds. As a result, we currently only know about as much about Venus as we did about Mars in the 1970s. But two new NASA missions and one from the European Space Agency aim to change that. Professor Richard Gale is leading the European Space Agency's Envision mission, fulfilling a lifetime curiosity about our nearest neighbour. I remember at primary school writing a story uh, you know, about Venus and what we knew. Um, and my mum still has the book somewhere where I, where I did that. It has just been my passion all the way through to understand this place. I think the selection of the NASA missions and Envision is a reflection that the space agencies have started to recognise that Venus needs a programme like Mars has in order to really understand it. And, and until we go and do that, we only think we know the answers, we don't really know anything. Venus was long thought to be a dead planet of little interest. We thought we understood Mars. We thought, you know, we have all these pictures of the surface, nothing's happened for four billion years, it was interesting early on and that was it and we thought the same on Venus we thought we understand Venus um, we have all these data but they and they're telling us that Venus is is static and what we've learned since is that Mars is nothing like that and it's much much more interesting Mariner 2 lifted off and began its three and a half month journey to Venus in 1962 Venus was the first planet to be successfully visited by spacecraft. The Russian Venera probes and US Mariner missions brought back data of high winds and a dense atmosphere of 95% carbon dioxide. The Magellan NASA flyby in 1990 sent back low quality images of the surface from orbit. It took another 16 years for a new mission to blast off the Venus Express in 2006, which focused on the planet's atmosphere, and in 2010, the Japanese Akutsuki probe launch. Venus Express detected probably volcanic activity ongoing and certainly in the recent past, and has shown us the atmosphere is very dynamic, much more dynamic than we would expect for a dead planet. And so we fully expect to find a lot more interest when we, when we look in more, much more detail. Professor Gale and his team believe that from learning more about Venus, we will also gain a wealth of knowledge about Earth. Geologist Dr. Philippa Mason is lead scientist on the mission. It's very similar to the Earth in many respects, and yet so tremendously different. How it's come to evolve to the way it is, is something that we don't yet understand fully. Venus may have been the first habitable world in the solar system, complete with an ocean and Earth-like climate. With this in mind, the mission aims to find insights into the potential future of Earth's atmosphere. The climate on Earth is very closely interrelated with and by the geology. We understand how the water and carbon are cycled. In a, in a bigger picture, the big sense, we don't really know how fragile the climate actually is. It may be more fragile than we, we realise even now, and it, it may be less. If we put too much carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, and it, it doesn't need much, I think it's somewhere around 3%. 
then you get a runaway effect and, and the water vapour never condenses in the atmosphere. You know, at the moment it condenses at the top of our troposphere, you get you get the cirrus clouds and things like that. That wouldn't happen and, and the, the water vapour gets into the upper atmosphere and then it's lost to space and you get this continuous runaway greenhouse effect and you lose your oceans and Earth turns into Venus. The data gathered from this mission will also help scientists to understand more about Earth-sized planets outside our solar system, exoplanets. The history of the Earth and our arrival and the, you know, the, the spontaneous arrival of life is so, so improbable on Earth. It's an extraordinary thing. This need to try and understand why Earth has ended up the way it has compared to Mars and Venus. You could consider Venus as being our nearest equivalent of an exoplanet. It may be like many others that we see beyond the solar system. And it may represent the future of Earth. Can you tell us about the instruments that will be on Envision? So the instruments are really designed to work together. Um, where, where this has come from is, is our experience in Earth observation. Um, you know, using radar data, using infrared data, uh, and a whole host of other sorts of data types that we can get from orbit. And we're having to do that on one spacecraft because we don't have the budget for six, and make the observations that we need from orbit. The mission plans to launch in 2032. Venus is the closest planet to Earth, so the journey will only take seven months. But Envision needs to be in a low and almost circular orbit to use its instruments. To achieve this, it will use a technique called aerobraking, skimming through the upper atmosphere for a short time every orbit for 15 months to slow it down enough to insert it into the right orbit. It sounds crazy, but actually it's been done several times at Mars. It's been done at Venus before with Magellan um, and with Venus Express as, as a demonstration. We're launched on what's called an Ariane 6-2, uh, which can launch about 1,600 kilos to Venus. The spacecraft is designed to assist that process, so we have big solar panels and, and other features that help slow the spacecraft down. And that saves us an enormous amount of fuel. If we didn't do that, we'd need what's called a 6-4, which can send about three or four tonnes to Venus. But it's an order of magnitude bigger rocket, more expensive, more fuel, everything else. So this saves us a huge amount of, of cost and time and effort. Once safely in orbit, the various instruments will start to take measurements. The imaging radar, Vensar, which is um, able to image the ground at high resolution, about 10 to 30 meters resolution, and give us those repeat measurements that tell us how the ground is changing. The 1990s NASA Magellan mission captured images of Venus' surface at 100 to 200 meters resolution. Envision will improve on this by providing images at 30 meter resolution and even higher on some areas of particular interest. We have a sounding radar, which um, you may have heard of, of or seen people dragging GPR units around the ground and probing the ground. And you can do that from orbit, and that's what this uh, subsurface sounder does. It gives us a sort of line profile into the subsurface across the planet, and that gives us an understanding of things like how thick a lava flows, where are the faults, that sort of thing. Taken together, the instruments will provide an interconnected set of data that they hope will yield more insights into our sister planet. It's the fact that we integrate them to try and understand better the processes and how they are interconnected. The coupling of geological processes with atmospheric through volcanism, for instance, and the cycling of uh, sulfur dioxide and other volatiles in the atmosphere. Um, so I think we're all really interested in the fact that these observations need to be considered together to really get an idea of the whole. Despite being an interplanetary mission supported by the European Space Agency, Envision runs on a relative shoestring. Both lead scientists have day jobs, and they'll need them for a while, because the data and images will only start returning to Earth in 2035. 
but forgive me, you might be nearing retirement by then. Why do you do it? Well, if it was easy, we would have done it already, wouldn't we? I mean, Mars is easy, let's face it. You know, it's got very little atmosphere. You can do all kinds of observations there. That, you know, that we, everything that we can do here, we can do there, more or less. Um, and uh, Venus is difficult. It's challenging to get there. It's in a, in, a, in a strange elliptical orbit. You know, sometimes it's very close, sometimes it's very far. There are many things on Venus which will be tremendously exciting to my colleagues who are focused very much on Earth. But many of them, quite understandably, say, oh, just, yeah, come and remind me in 10 years' time when you get there, you know, when you're on your way. And what is it that makes some people really doggedly stubborn, like ourselves? I don't know. I have a drive to, to show that, that Venus is active, that it's Earth-like, and, and I want the answers to these questions because I think they're really important. Um, but I also recognise that my career benefited from starting out on Magellan. And somebody... In, in NASA, proposed that mission, put effort into that mission and made it happen. And it took, took them 10 or 12 years to make that mission happen. And yes, they, they got to see the results, but really a whole swathe of other people benefited from it. So in some ways, I see this as my sort of payback and my personal legacy, if you like, that I'm giving something back to the community, but also I think I'm, I'm helping to sustain it into the future.